Welcome everybody to another amazing talk photography. And this tonight, I'm joined with Circa Lisa Continent, and uh, joining us from sunny where? Uh, Time Mouth, northeast. The northeast. northeast. I <laughs> hope it's cooler than it is in the southwest here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's really hot down here at present. As I said, I do apologise if, if anybody can hear the fans, um, but I mel I'm melting as I'm going and things really. Right. So without delay, um, before we kind of give you the screen, uh, tell us a little bit about you. Can you tell us when it all began? This passion in photography and how it kind of became your life. It started when I was uh, around 12 years old and. Uh, it was really my auntie Oily in Finland. I was I was born and brought up in Finland, and I had this uh, auntie Oily who was a keen photographer, just photographing my family really, uh, but spending every summer with us. And um, I just had this um, uh, magical time every Christmas, rushing to the album that she had made of the previous summers. Uh, highlights um, at the summer cottage where we all all spent the summer together. Um, so that was definitely one thing and she lent me her camera then when I was about 12 and I started uh, testing it out and things like um, could it capture the sparkles of snow for instance and and then started photographing my friends and soon after that uh, I started saving up my pocket money and bought this little, um, I think it was a Felica camera. Um, and following on that, um, I I won a prize at a children's drawing competition, which was 365 large chocolate bars, um, yes. <laughs> one for every every day of a year. So. I, I hauled these boxes of chocolate to my uh, um, village shopkeeper and I asked him to buy them off me, <laughs> which he kindly did. And with that money, I bought myself an enlarger. Um, from then on, um, I joined um, an amateur photography club in the nearby town, took the train there once a week. I learned to uh, process film and to print. Um, all the other other members were kind of middle-aged men, very kind. Um, basically taught me the skills to get going as a photographer. So that was the very beginning. And then uh, when after um, my uh, A-levels, I applied to study English. I wanted to get out into the world, maybe as a kind of journalist and a photographer. Um, and I worked um, as an apprentice with uh, the only photographer that I, I knew was doing it professionally because his pictures were in the, in the women's magazines. And he was a fashion photographer, an advertising photographer, and he took me on after I had been um, basically chasing him for through letters for some time and he relented eventually and he took me on as an apprentice. And I did that for a year, basically just um, spotting his photographs, his black and white photographs and processing film for him. And at the end of that, I had al already moved on to hearing about the uh, Regent Street Polytechnic in London uh, film school because in Finland at that time there wasn't yet a, a school for, you know, like a university, a course for photography. And I wanted to, um, to have an education. So if it couldn't be photography, it could be film. I naively thought I could just, <laughs> just walk into the film industry, uh, becoming a film editor maybe. I'd seen film editors in, um, in Warsaw uh, in Poland, and they were all women in the studios. I thought, well, there's a job for a woman, at least in the film industry. But what happened then, of course, is the start of the story of Amber Films, Amber Film and Photography Collective, which started um, 
at the Regent Street Polytechnic with the final year students already having worked together, wanting to continue. And I joined their ranks and together we established the um, collective, Film and Photography Collective, AMBA, and virtually immediately uh, moved up to the northeast of England because we wanted to work in a community in the, one of the industrial communities or several in the northeast um, working working with what we call working class and, and marginal or marginal, marginalized communities and that was that was really the basis of our coming together wanting to work in an egalitarian collective mm. and um, all skills based so we brought all our skills into the collective and we began to make films very was it very hard at the time to was it very hard at the time to actually you know make a basic living and out of you know doc, uh, documentary photography and things really how was it in the start for you oh we didn't really make a living out of that for a very long time uh, for the first 15 years i think i was i was we, we were all doing a little bit of education, a uh, little bit of, uh, you know, maybe a day or two in an art school or um, I'd actually left before I had a, even a degree. I left after my first year because the others were ready to leave um, the course when I entered. So I left, left it without any qualifications. But nevertheless, I could get uh, um, jobs creating a, a slide library for the um, Newcastle Art School at the time and from that we created an actual business uh, of making educational slides about all kinds of uh, subjects like uh, vernacular uh, art forms and and architecture and and etc um, which we uh, which created a way a wage for one person at least and we sold these slides slides to art schools around the world in fact um so that was one income stream but i mean there were beginning. all sorts of jobs that we we ended up doing for I, had, I did that for 15 years basically before i started um getting grants i did get grants from the beginning but not enough to work to live on so um and, so, and was it very? Was it Sorry. before? Uh, my last question before we get going. Was it very hard as a female photographer in a very male-dominated kind of in industry that I was aware of? Obviously, uh, slightly before my time, but not a huge amount. But was it hard to make uh, to make your way, or did you, uh, you know, it was it just a thing that you were doing? within the collective uh which basically what we did was we shared all our income we put it all in a pot we took out the same equal wage all of us whatever we did so we could all uh sustain ourselves on basic sort of minimum wage and it was actually in 1974 i think it was eight pounds a week <laughs> which at that time we could live on because we did we were just renting cheaply and you know everything we owned was second hand and and uh, that was actually our philosophy that if you don't uh, make yourself dependent on on money that if money is not your goal you you can live um, as little as possible that gives you the freedom to do what you want to do. So I started photographing like in Baika straight away. I moved there uh, just to find a home for myself when we came to the Northeast and then started photographing. And that's how I've worked really. I mean, I didn't have funding for any of these projects to begin with, but I did get some grants along the way. Okay. Um, but no, no, I don't think in terms of being a woman, I think it's probably played in my favor all, all through my mm. 
career because I haven't entered the commercial world as such at all. Um, maybe it would have been tougher there, but I did get enough opportunities. If I'd wanted more, I think I could have could have used more. Um, you know, I would could have accessed more commercial work, but I, I didn't go that that way. You know, I wanted to concentrate on documentary photography. And then what did happen, of course, was we did have almost a rolling contract with Channel for Television when that uh, was established. And for 11 years, we had funding from Channel for Television then to make our feature films and documentaries. And, and that funding basically covered all our wages for all those years. So it, it's, yeah. Good. Was um, let's give you the screen and we'll start to look at some images, shall we? So I'm just going to um, look for your attendees and I'm just going to give you the screen like we practice. So I'm going to make you the presenter. You should see a little window that says show my screen. There we go. I can see your screen. Okay. There you go. Take it away. So you can see Baika. And the date. Yeah. You can see that. Okay, so this is, like I said, this was my home first and foremost when I came to the northeast of England and I began to photograph it uh, just to be able to shout about it because it was such a wonderful, amazing community to become part of. And um, so I, I photographed it. Uh, and lived there for seven years until my street came down. Biker was being uh, uh, demolished then to make way for uh, for a new housing development. Um, and eventually my street came down and I had to move out. But the thing about working there that I wanted to uh, show with the pictures that I've taken there is that because and I think I was very fortunate to be a documentary photographer before the social media was invented because there really weren't any worries about any unexpected consequences. I mean, people didn't, uh, I mean, they thought I was a bit, bit, bit of an eccentric, um, you know, just giving away my photographs. It didn't make a kind of any, any sort of commercial sense to them. But my, I I had been, I did receive um, the Northern Arts, Northern Gasbound Fellowship in Creative Photography in 1972, which then suddenly put me on the telly and in the paper. So people in Pika did know pretty well what I was doing and what for. Um, so I didn't need to go around sort of explaining myself. Um, so what I did was uh, I was uh, photographing. I was I was doing what what is known broadly as, as street photography to begin with. I, I was free to roam just about anywhere in the streets and and the pubs and the and the clubs and the shops, and it was a very safe place to live for me. Um, and I then set up. Um, pre-portrait studio in an empty hairdressing saloon in the main street right opposite the busy bus, bus stop and in its large window I had an evolving exhibition of the photographs I was taking and you know thinking back about what social media why people are concerned quite rightly about social media and photography is that pictures can end up being seen all over the world even uh, from very private situations. So if my pictures in the shop window were not liked by someone, they would come and tell me and I would take their picture down. And it only ever happened once anyway, and, and only temporarily. <laughs> so anyway, it's just to say generally about the biker work that it, it, I can see that the driving force for me was uh, a kind of celebration of, of the community. And I think all of my work, looking back, is about communities of one kind or, or another. So we'll start with this. Um, 
this picture, 1971, and this was um, children playing with collected junk by the biker bridge, which you can see in the background. That, that is the bridge that connects biker to the uh, central Newcastle, it's just a walk away. And this was in 1971. And in, in the early 70s and throughout my time in biker, children basically played in the streets and they were not being watched over by adults. Um, so this is, this is just a playground that children have created for themselves with all the junk that was being thrown out of the houses that were becoming empty by and by to make way for the um, demolition and the redevelopment. And with these children, I mean, they would follow me around, basically, and uh, sort of congregate around the lens. So I would tell them, like I told these children, if you want to be photographed, you'll just, you'll have to sit still for a moment. <laughs> and uh, that's how this picture happened. And it's the only one where I have the children sitting still like this. Mm. And one of the, one of the, um, these guys in the picture, I actually have met recently. And he said, he remembers me going around with the camera and, and they were just saying, there, there she goes again, the wifey, the wifey with the camera going click, click, click. Um, so anyway, you know, I, nobody worried about me. Um, there, there's so a I question come to... through about that, in fact. Do you think that you could take the same photograph today without the thought of permissions or, um, you know, in this weird world that we have where we we almost feel that everybody's kind of, you can't do this and you can't do that. Would you still be able to take the same photograph guilt-free like we were, like you were then? No, I'll, I'll come to that in a bit because I did go back to Biker like 25 years later. Okay. And I came across exactly the world that you're describing now where it is not okay to photograph children or absolutely almost anyone without their permission. But there are ways around that as well. So, um, no, I couldn't, I mean, you wouldn't even see children out on their own like this now. No, um, no, no you're right. <clears throat> um, another question through. Uh, as far as the, pro uh, the processing was concerned, was that everything that you did yourself uh, technically speaking, yes, yes, I, I've always done everything myself. I've processed the film when working uh, in black and white. I mean, I, I have worked in color later on. I haven't processed color, but um, but with black and white, I have done the processing and the printing, and I've still got a dark room now, and I still print. I, I, I've been very... Uh, um, I see it very much as part of my, how would you say it, like the, well, initially I think all the photographers of my generation did their own, own processing and printing, but I have kind of, it's become very much part of the uh, art form, if you like, uh, what you can do in your printing, you know, to, to make it the way you want it to be. I mean, I have become quite... Uh, obsessed with getting everything out of the negative, as it were. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's part of the part of my practice, definitely. And question come through again. Um, do you still shoot film, or are you solely digital now? Um, well, I, there is a little project going on now. The first one that I am using digital capture for, and. That is really after, after I more or less thought that's it. Uh, but I was kind of uh, teased back into it by a, by a friend, a woman photographer half my age who wanted to do a fun project together with me. And yeah, I can see that um, digital, digital capture can give you something. Um, it's a different way of working, but it's, it can deliver something that analog 
would not. I would have to consider every frame carefully in analog, you know, film-based photography. In digital, you can shoot a thousand frames in, in a few minutes and then do the editing as it were afterwards. You know, I mean, that's where you do your, you find your decisive moment. You know, so it's um, interesting. Yeah, yeah, very. Um, should we move on to the next image, unless there's anything else to cover on this one? A couple of more questions coming through, but I'll hold back on those yet. Uh, okay. Anna Helena says hello from Oslo. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello, Anna Helene. Where are you? I can't see you, but hello. <laughs> no, no, we can't see any of them, but hello, Anna. No. Uh, Lovely. Uh, all right. Well, this image is the one that's uh, the girl on a space hopper in 1971. Um, now, this image is something that has become like my, uh, how would you say it, shadow <laughs> figure. She just follows me. I can't, I can't uh, put her on the shelf. She's always with me one way or another. And the latest um, thing that has happened, uh, I didn't know at the time who she was because it happened so quickly, this picture. But somebody, a woman with her family came round to the Amber offices a few years ago now, maybe five years ago, and um, told me that she had found herself in the, in the biker book and she was the girl on the uh, space hopper. So that then started us thinking it would be wonderful to actually make a film about her. Um, and we did. We made a film uh, in which her whole family kind of reminisced about this picture. Uh, and her brother remembers me uh, taking it. And then, I have to say, there was also someone else who remembered me taking that picture of her and remembers me asking her mother for permission to take it. And of course, these are two different women. So <laughs> having made the film about the first one, we then made the, the film about the second one. And then there were two more women who claimed to be her. Yeah. So it seems like this is one of those pictures where, where you can, anyone who wishes to do so can project themselves onto it. And um, I think that's 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 quite exciting. In, that, that, that's that's quite exciting in, in its own way, isn't it? Really, because you have no idea who she is. You anybody could say who they are there. Mm -hmm. That that is as a you know you've said already that that could be a whole I am the space hopper princess or whatever. It could almost be a documentary for the rest of your career. <laughs> Uh, and you could put anybody in there. I mean, AI comes to instant um, uh, kind of recall everything going on. There's a few questions on AI. We'll get to them later on. But in today, you don't even know if that is a space hopper with a girl on it, because it could be completely computer generated. No, um, it could not be computer generated in 1971. No, no. What I meant is that in in a future generations, we'll never know if it if it was even a real, I don't mean your photograph, but something similar. Oh, we'll I never see. know if it was real or not kind of thing with it, you know, but. Uh, yes, of course. How many women have you photographed on a space hopper then now? Me? No, only her. Oh, just her? No, no, the, the women who have come to claim to be her are in, in their 50s now. Yes, no, this I get that. like half a century ago, ago yeah, no, when I, I took this photograph. So, but of course, at that time, uh, space hoppers were, uh, many, many children had them, and many little girls would have been bouncing around on, on them. So, you know, it's perhaps easy enough to, to think that, yeah, that's my, my picture, that's me. Sometimes I, I even wonder if it's me, because it's kind of sticking to me in such a such a persistent way, it just keeps kind of traveling with me. 
Um, question two about um, how do you um, conserve your negative stock at pre present? Any special hints and tips on protecting your neg negatives? Now, I know that it probably should be in a cool storage, but mine, well, mine, mine are actually part of, at the moment, they are just still uh, uh, they're part of the um, Amberside um, um, collection trust. I mean, we have a trust now for the collection that uh, of photography and film that we have uh, uh, accumulated over the past 40, 50 years. And there is uh, storage there that is kind of controlled temperature. But I think if you really, really want it to be, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, I mean, you, you can probably read up about it, but I think the colder the better, possibly. Um, unless you keep bringing them out, then you have to look out for condensation and so on. Because I still use mine, so they, they need to be to hand. I haven't put them in, in cold storage uh, for all time. And in fact, my dilemma is more about what to do with them eventually. Do I want them to, to be uh, left after I go? Or do, do I want them to be available for research purposes or I wouldn't want them to be printed from anymore because I think the printing of it is, is part of my um, own sort of practice and vision for those images. So yeah, that's where I would like to get <laughs> some advice for do photographers of my age too with their Very legacy. Good. good. Should we move on? Now, this is, um, you can see this work went on for some time. Now, the writing in the sand, this is about the northeastern beaches, which are beautiful sandy beaches if you haven't been up here. And on these beaches, you'll find all life. Um, and I basically did not want this project ever to end. Um, so I did keep it going for a good 20 years. So I will start with the pictures. Um, this was handstands in Calacoats, Calacoats Bay, 1978. Um, so on a warm summer's day on a northeastern beach, you would find children running everywhere. And families would be picnicking side by side with people they didn't know. Uh, there could be 10,000 people over a, a bank holiday weekend on, on the um, Long Sands and King Edwards Bay and Whitley Bay beaches. So when, when I was photographing, it was, it was um, still before the uh, social media era. People didn't carry their own cameras to the beach and nobody seemed to worry about me taking their pictures. But because I don't use a telephoto lens, I would have to get close to the subject. And basically, I would be in a relationship with them. And the way I would um, kind of negotiate my right to take a picture, if I was spotted first, I would sort of smile and point at my camera and wait for permission, which would uh, always, in fact, I don't think I was ever rebuffed. Um, so I would take the picture and then I, would, I could offer to send them a print if they wanted one. If they wanted to leave an address, I would send a print. Um, sometimes, obviously, I would take a photograph before they would uh, I would be noticed. And then if I was noticed, I would go to the people and explain what I was doing. And again, it would just be simply, yeah, there I am just um, documenting life on the 
on the beaches and one day maybe there's an exhibition, who knows. But there was nothing more that, you know, people needed to worry about. Um, so, um, yeah. So anyway, I mean, I was, I would be walking around in a bikini myself and eventually I would have my little daughter and her friends in tow. So anything, you know, you do on these beaches is in, they are public beaches and um, people know that um, whatever they get up to is in plain sight of everybody else, including myself with the camera. So I would be, uh, I would be seen doing what I was doing if anybody was interested. Um, well, once I was actually, uh, you know, I, I would actually have to dampen the enthusiasm of some of the kids because they would get up to really dangerous stunts just for the picture. And, uh, and one time I was thrown into the sea by, by some boisterous group of youths who, who luckily did take my camera off my neck first for safety. Very good. I think that's my grandma on the right hand side there. When ah, I was a kid. No, you're not the only one. I tell you. <laughs> it's not true. really, no, no. But it could be my grandma. <laughs> so many people have said that. So many people have said that. I think there was a certain look of the time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I was looking yes. at the badges on the girl in the black bather. I was thinking, I had one of those badges. That's that's a hundred uh, uh yard dashed badge that she's got on swimming uh badge on there and thing or something like that anyway but uh -huh. um hey -oh, very funny good yeah. thank you next image um right these are just two lassies who um who probably probably just got off the train and and i mean this is something that you saw quite a lot of it's young people just going in the sea in all their clothes, just for the laugh of it. And that's obviously what these two, two women were, two young girls were doing. So, you know, the bikini outfit came handy here because I would have to wade in um, to get anywhere near them to take this picture. So that was my working, working outfit um, for this project. Um, so there's question? Not, not much else I can say about this particular. No, it's okay. Somebody device. said it, it looks like she's missing the uh, iPhone in her hand, taking a selfie. Do you <laughs> see the way she's raising the hand? It does look like uh, that. Anyway, yeah, yeah, uh, before, right up to speed. Um, uh, Len, lens choice, what kind of lenses were you using at the time or what's your preferred thing for street photography and documentary? Um, well, I would use the um, obviously the 35 millimeter format um, negative. Um, so, and I used the mostly the 35 mil uh, wide angle lens. I think that was virtually my standard lens because I really kind of liked how close I, I needed to get, but also how much else it would keep in sharp focus around and in the background. There's a oh. question come through about exposure. Do you use all the automatic mode or manual? I don't think there was an automatic mode at the time, except for the little needle uh, that was telling you whether you're close or not and things. So uh, uh, yeah, there is no automatic mode at this time. No, there was none, no, but I would, um, did you use a Western master or anything, or did you just um, know the exposure? How did you work in expo exposures? I did have a Western master, yeah. But I, uh, on, the, um, on the beaches, the light was so consistent that I would, I would even crank up the film from 400 ASA with two bath processing to 650, so I would get a thousandth of a second exposure times and still f8 so that was absolutely a plum of a light light situation to photograph in so i could capture any any speed of movement mm, and still 
still get everything else in focus as well. Um, yeah. I, I love all the comments coming through. Is this where the self the selfies began? <laughs> we know it's not, but it could be a snap a snapshot of today kind of thing with it. Brilliant. Great. Yeah. Um, next image, please. Or so, next slide. Next project was step by step, which um is um a centers around a dancing school, small dancing school in North Shields, fishing town. Um, and uh, there was dancing. There were lots of dancing schools in the region at that at that time. Still, sixty, I think, uh, in the region, or North Shields alone, several several uh, dancing schools. And this one, the Cornell Brown Dancing School, was one where I I began to photograph in 1982, um, and it. This was the first time that I kind of stepped stepped away from street photography, and I was working with a medium format camera, uh, with a 6.7 format, in fact, on a tripod, with uh, extra lighting. Yeah, I'm sure I did. I have a had a um, a flash, a bounced flash with me. So that was quite a quite a sort of a big setup but I um, I was uh, given all the freedom to photograph the, all the uh, uh, the girls and and the mothers who also were dancing and it was the kind of the female community that was so attractive about the school the friendships in there and the uh, mother-daughter relationships which were very strong because of this shared uh, activity um, and I, it was also important to me by then to have the permission given each time I entered a new situation or each day I arrived to take photographs so I would get the permission to, before I began and later on why it went on till 87 I actually followed the girls growing up and then um, going into the outside world to see what how their lives panned out and their dreams and their dancing and other things um, and i collected also stories their stories testimonies dialogues written written stuff because that had already in bike become my practice and how I then um, use the words this is often um, almost as a counterpoint to the images when I when I start working on a book or an exhibition so they complement each other and give the subjects a voice so it's not just my take on them visually it's also their words often commenting either on themselves or, or just generally telling me about their lives. So you get a multifaceted um, portrait, as it were, of the people I photographed. So this was, yeah, what I would call negotiated photography. Um, so now there's another step by step, which means these projects could go on forever and more is that we this film still here that i referred to which was made by myself and peter roberts who is my partner at Hampa and also my husband and we have made seven photo films together or starting with fo my photographs and projects and then developing into films and the early amber crew made a film about uh, uh, a dan this dancing school already and in, in this uh, recapture, like 50, 40 years later in this case, uh, we had the same women looking at themselves as young teenagers actually um, practicing modeling for a modeling exam at this uh, dancing school. And then uh, like 
like goggle box I've, we filmed them looking at themselves and basically killing themselves laughing at what they were doing as teenagers so these again are people who are finding me now because we have never moved away from newcastle and people you know children i photographed half a century ago are now now coming to us and and updating their life stories um so anyway should show you a picture by now so this picture is to do is from this project and this is um margaret bull who was the first female stoker and senior caretaker in north timeside 1982. i'll tell you a little bit about her because both of these photographs from this project i'm going to show you are about her and she was a single mother whose daughters were pupils at the dancing school and she fought herself a position as the first woman stoke and senior caretaker on Tyneside. And this is what she told me. I wanted a man's job and a man's wage to bring up a family. So I got cracking in the boiler house and I loved every minute of it. And she says, I'm a shop steward in my union. I fought for women in the Labour Party and in my union right through my two marriages and divorces three kids, some rotten jobs and asbestosis. And I don't want to see other women getting a raw deal. Now, this was her day job. And of course, like many of the mothers or daughters were at the, taking lessons at the dancing school, she did too. And here she is. And she continued to say, when I've worked nine hours in the boiler room, in the muck and the heat and the cloud and the shit and shifted a ton and a half of coal, it's difficult for me to be graceful with my arms, corns in my hands, arthritis. Sometimes my hands get so embedded, it shows. But if you're too particular about your image, you cannot dance. You want to dance, you've got to throw yourself in it. Oh, not bother at all. So, okay, so here's um, Margaret. And, and the thing that I find generally with projects that go on for, for long periods, like especially with this one, when, when I worked with the same women as girls first and young women and their mothers, alongside that you find so many different sides to them i mean you you are constantly surprised at how many persons you have in the one <laughs> you you think uh well first of all would you expect a stalker a caretaker in a school going back to this one mm. to then be be this so i just chose those two pictures from this project because most of them are of the girls of course doing all the stuff they do at the dancing school but yeah. but i am the one a sign of the times. If you could go back to the black and white um, of the girl in the um, the ballet dancer, um, there was a couple Sorry. of questions coming through on here. You know, yeah. the heritage of the image, um, and actually everything that she surrounds herself with, tells as much about her as it is the woman in the dress. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's very apt as well with it and things. There's a few cottages in Wales in the Welsh Museum life. There's a few places like it around the world, I'm sure but they actually um, do it through the decades and you can see how the house changed and the gardens changed and the belongings and everything else with it and things really. And, uh, and this was a rough time at this time zone in, in the, the Northeast, wasn't it? Not just around Britain, but this was a very heavy time of life. Financially, uh, it was a hard sure. life as well. Sure, sure. 
And the thing about the dancing school, just to say quickly, is that although some of the things that they were learning, and they had maybe 20 different subjects that they were taught, including including elocution, because it was a kind of a finishing school for mostly working class girls. Um, and some of it was a bit daft, like the modeling class. You, they were laughing at themselves now, seeing what they did and put themselves through at the time for medals. But the discipline required to get uh, through all these years of, of dancing exams actually did give them something that they could then apply to their working lives later. And that was quite quite remarkable that all these girls that I, I got to know, maybe 20 or 30 of them that I photographed, that all of them actually got, did get jobs, not, not in dancing, obviously. Uh, a couple of them started their own little dancing classes. Um, but they did get something from this rigorous training that um, served them well. I mean, there was a lot of unemployment at the, at the time, that's for sure. Certainly no shields where, they, where the school was and the fishing industry was being run down and, and so Good. on. But, Thank you. Yeah. Move on, shall we? So now we go back to Baika. 2003, I was invited back to Baika. That was 25 years after I left, after Baika was pulled down and it had been rebuilt. Uh, it was now the <coughs> Baika Wall estate or Baika Wall, um, designed by the visionary architect Ralph uh, Erskine. Now, the original Baika community was dispersed. Uh, in the in order to make space for this rebuild and they were promised uh, that they could they will be brought back as the community they will end up living next to their old neighbors in brand new homes and yes it never happened it took too long to rebuild the new bike and very few of them ever came back um, when I went to Baika then, uh, in, to the new estate, 2003, um, I, I didn't know anybody there anymore. Um, and most of the people living there didn't know each other either. And that was at the time also when the Baika was going, the new Baika was going through a, a monumental new change and that was because it had become, amongst other things, a, a reception center for uh, asylum seekers coming mostly from Africa and some from Asia and elsewhere. So suddenly Baika became very colorful in its, uh, in its population. And um, that is the second project that I had to do in color then because color was part of the story, especially with the asylum seekers, um, whose only form, only possessions from their old lives often wear just their clothes or, or, or their sort of visual, um, dis their desire to rebuild something uh, with the whatever they could get their hands on to, to create something, a feeling of home in the, um, in the houses that they were allocated. Um, so anyway, I, um, I, was, um, I got to know the asylum seekers through being a, a volunteer in the asylum seeker support group for over three years. And then I also just Accosted people in the street, I would uh, get introductions and I would would basically photograph anyone who wanted to be photographed. And over the six years that I was working there, quite intensively, I photographed maybe about 100 families or 100 groups of individuals. And the process was always just speaking 
getting to know each other. And then I would put this proposition to the people. Uh, if you had just one picture to describe yourself in and to introduce yourself to your neighbors and to the wide world, um, what would you have in it? So that was the kind of a game that um, then um, allowed people to imagine, you know, fill the frame. You can fill the frame completely. It doesn't have to be material things. It can be symbolic things as well. But this is like your calling card. And after the initial meetings and discussions and, and ideas that would come from them, we would I would then set up, choose the place in the home and um, set all the equipment up. And this time I would have proper uh, reflected flashlight and tripod. I have a, quite a lot of kit. And, um, and then I would just wait in a way or have conversation, keep things um, going before I start shooting because I would only have 10 frames on that roll of film. So I wanted to wait for something surprising to happen in front of the camera, something that wasn't just posing for me. And um, that was the goal. Anyway, I've got two pictures to, to show how that panned out, two, two different kinds of uh, situations. So this one, this is a woman um, called Nancy Jade, and she's a student from Burundi, uh, 2014. And Nancy Jade, um, she absolutely relished the challenge of putting her life in just one picture. And she had thought about it very hard. Uh, first of all, she told me to wait till her mother made her a dress, this dress for the picture. And that took three months. And then when we came to, uh, to start uh, making this picture, she had arranged a portrait of herself on, the, um, on her uh, computer screen to show herself as a student, which she was. And she uh, put a picture uh, from a film um, of an African woman on, on the video uh, on her TV to really talk about her feminist politics. Uh, the ship she's holding, she just picked up from a charity shop. And she's um, having it in the picture as an illusion, as, as a, to point to her desire to travel. And then finally, she was showing me a dance from her village in Burundi. So that was the picture and it was as she wanted it in every detail. Very cool. Uh, questions come through about, uh, do you struggle with color? Struggling in white fat. I, I think what they mean is, uh, as you've been a black and white photographer for most oh. of your career and life, do you struggle taking photographs in color? Do they, do, does it not interpret, I suppose, in the way that you would have interpreted? Right. Well, there is a very good reason in in my mind why I did do this project in color. And there is another one I did in color before this one, which was uh, the Coal Coast project, which was about the East Durham uh, coastline, which is pretty much man-made, or was at that time, 2000, when, when I was photographing 10 years after the last of the mines had closed. And the beach was still uh, black from uh, coal dust, and there was um, all manner of chemicals coloring the water on the beaches, and, and it was a strange strange world um, but every bit of color every bit of uh, 
Brigger Brunk on the beach was saying, telling me something about the mine, mining industry. And I had a miner, an ex-miner, retired miner, who, who took me on a walkabout on the beach. And he interpreted everything that we were saying to me. And I realized, I started that project in black and white and realized pretty soon that I couldn't tell that story, except in color. And that was the first time I switched to color. Now, uh, Biker Revisited is the second one that I did in color. And it is actually the last really big project that I have done. Um, so the color was part of the story. Um, so in a sense, just to answer the question that I think even if I'd had the uh, possibility of doing the original bike project in color, I don't think I would have. I wouldn't because there the simplicity of black and white I feel allows you to be drawn to the people in the picture before any errant uh, striking colors here and there. Um, it kind of serves the, um, the point of the subject, which was about the people. Um, so I think it's horses for courses, really. Um, color, of course, you have to, you know, I do also print color myself, but I print it like um, digital sort of archival paper, pigment inks. So I work on all my digital files myself, so I can control how the color uh, is accentuated. I can play it down if it needs to a little bit, or I can uh, forefront it if I want to. I mean, generally, I stay true to the original color scheme. But Good. I don't feel overwhelmed by it. You know, I can I can use it more strategically than. Um, Great. Should we have a look at the last image? Same project. This was uh, David with his daughters in two thousand and eight, and this one actually demonstrates what I started off saying was that I had this two goals. One was. Um, to have a properly lit situation. I wanted to do uh, a, a photograph that uh, is not just grabbing something in these fairly dark little homes, but would give them the chance to have a proper, uh, like almost like a painting um, of themselves you know, dignified as as good as I could make it, as well as I could make it. And um, then once that was all set up, that something unexpected or surprising would happen, something authentic, uh, spontaneous would take place. And this <laughs> image was the one that really came about the, the, uh, without any preparation hardly, because I had been introduced to him, to this, to David, by his grandmother, who was Lebanese. He, she actually beat me to being the first foreigner ever in Baika in 1969. Um, I had photographed her the same morning, and she took me to photograph David before he was taking his family out of Baika the next day. They were moving out, and the rest of the household were already in car cardboard boxes. But he he agreed to be photographed um, one last portrait of his family before leaving. Um, now, I could see, I was all set up to start, and I could see the dog in the kitchen in the background, this fierce looking dog. And uh, he called it out, so the dog came and and was going to be part of the picture. And there is also a baby there somewhere on the floor. You can see a little bit of her <laughs> sticking out. The wife, wife wanted to stay out of it. But just as I was about to take the picture, David says, hang on, wait, I, I know what the dog likes best. And he disappeared 
and came back with this uh, soap bubble blower and started blowing bubbles and, and the dog was kind of snapping at them. So there it was, I was ready to press the shutter. And it was over 10 frames and that was it, but that was the one with the, where the dog was just about to get the bubble. Excellent. Thank you so much for, share, uh, for sharing those images with us tonight. Um, we've got a couple of questions. I'll just take the screen back if that's okay. Let me mm -hmm. uh, do like Mark the presenter. Share my screen. So um okay, I'm sixteen, just getting star started in street photography. Would you recommend that I ditch the digital and go analog? Oh, <laughs> I'll leave that one to I, you. <laughs> I don't think I would recommend that unless you are really, really keen to uh, to do uh, analog photography. There's there's a couple of reasons why I wouldn't I wouldn't um, I I don't have any reason why I would recommend it because. It's so expensive for starters. If you're 16 and you're just starting, um, unless you're mad keen on processing and doing all that kind of chemical side, and there's something in that, you know, that is so beautiful. But, um, and film is expensive. It's hard to get hold of all the materials now, even for the darkroom end of it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, digital capture is, is great. I mean, I, I, I would definitely, if I was starting now, I would, I would go for digital. I, I remember how much it cost me getting going at a similar age, and then it was easily available, isn't it? You know, um, but again, I'll just reiterate what you said. I think it would be a, a very expensive move, um, and. Yeah, I, I, I'd back you up on that. I would stay on the digital front. Eventually, do yourself a project, uh, but try and use one roll of film. Um, there's a mentality with digital where basically you shoot a lot and you edit hard. If you're shooting with film, uh, basically you shoot a lot less um, and you, you wait for the image a lot longer. So that could be, I suppose, if you want to have a an analog experience cover up the back of your camera so you can't see the screen use the camera in complete manual mode and before you do anything set up the camera that you only shoot a jpeg and only shoot in black and white that that will give you a near digital experience in analog photography the key thing is hide your screen you don't want to be doing you want the excitement of opening it up for the first time and seeing it kind of develop i mean i'm sh i'm sure sir sir Kalisa, that when we used to look at the negatives coming out of the wet that was exhilarating and you knew the image you were looking for it's like i hope i got that i hope i got that and and mm -hmm. that's why i would suggest you covering up the back of your camera and taking out that card and basically not looking at that card until you download everything. And I think that that will give you a near analog experience if you completely take the in Polaroid. Digital is so much like a Polaroid, but instead of having to wait for a minute and a half, now you have to wait a blink of an eye and you instantly see your image and you're too quick to change without thought. And I, and I would, back up circa by saying don't do it but if you really are looking for a near analog experience i i i, I would do what i suggested in just covering everything up go into manual mode believing in yourself believing in your eye and just allow yourself to only take x amount of shots the smaller the cards the better <laughs> because your discipline you go oh my god i got six shots left you know um I'm not sure if you've ever done that, Circa, have you, uh, with, with digital at all? Well, what I'm doing with digital capture is so very different. I'm setting up uh, a kind of pop-up studio with a friend 
and with a studio flash light where you can keep shooting almost like film. But it's it's a different situation. It's it's um, um, working with grabbing. Well, uh, maybe I won't talk about it too much. Yeah, but, yeah, no, no, no. We'll get you back on that again. Yeah. It's but I would I would back you up uh, on on the discipline side of of working with analog because I think what that does um, is it allows you to uh, anticipate. And you get very good at it if you if you are doing it like on the beach. I would be there like first person in the morning, so that I would really feel that I belong there. And I, after a couple of week, weeks, you, you kind of get to the point where you take the picture before you think about it because you know that's it, that's the moment, and you are very in, attuned to how something is developing in front of you. And it's, it's, I don't know whether, um, you know, it, it gives you, you, you know, it's like Cartier Bresson talks about the decisive moment. Uh, you could easily miss it if you're shooting continually. You may just, because then you're not even seeing what you're, what you're taking. It's almost like working, working blind, I think. Um, I think definitely, like you were saying, the discipline of just having like 10 or 12 shots in a row or, or whatever, just one roll, and then no more. And you just learn to anticipate and be ready and be close enough or wherever you want to be. So you take everything into account before you actually press the shutter. The, the then, only thing you miss, the, the only thing you miss out on, is the dark room, and the the, the dark room is uh, quite an extraordinary time warp that you can enter a black hole and exit a black hole, and a day has passed, and yes. you don't even realize it. That 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 would be from my heart. That might be the only thing that you will miss if you never get the experience of shooting film and developing your own film. I would say that. That that is, you know what I mean. It, it is an extraordinary experience to watch it appear, and then to desperately want to reprint it again and again and again yes. and again yes. and again, because you know every time you print it, you're trying to bring something out of it. And Absolutely. That is quite exciting, <laughs> but it's very frustrating as well, isn't it? You know. Uh, and I'm I'm glad. Uh, that we have had the opportunity to go through the film years without a doubt. But for you, uh, Ryan, um, I'll name you. Um, I would just suggest that you you basically, unless you're Rothschild and you can really afford uh, uh, to buy a lot of film um, and waste a lot of film, then digital is the route to go. You could, you could go on a course if there are any courses. Uh, it might be interesting just to do a course in, in um, analog photography yeah, it, or, 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 you know, shoot some film and learn to process and print just to have have that uh, experience, even even if it is just to learn it. And yeah. then, you know, you can, you can continue digitally, but you will get something from that. You, you can uh, just quite magical. Yourself. It is quite yeah, magical. You, you yeah. can discipline yourself in the world of digital. Um, as I said, switch the raw off, which I never usually recommend. But if you're looking for an analog experience, an honest one, um, walking out onto the high street and shooting a JPEG only in black and white, if that's what your preferred thing's going to be, um, that will be a way for you to do it. A, a bit like um, I was lucky to be involved with the photo marathon in Cardiff. And um, I, I was asked to judge in the early years, and then years on, uh, me and a few of my assistants, we used to uh, donate our time in the, mo uh, the morning for all the registrations, and basically uh, making sure their cards were blank. They they had a topic per hour that was really, you know, great fun part of photography and things. Really. But making sure their cards were blank before they went out uh, uh, was a, a key thing, so that they could only take. 12 shots that was it 
12 images. That's all they could take, and they had to make the decision about taking that photograph. From the we could talk all day about that alone with it. Okay, um, back to it. Um, is Biker um, the same place that is referred to in Biker Grove? Um, well, I haven't actually watched Biker Grove. It is, it is meant to be the same, but I don't think it is necessarily shot there. No, uh, me I, either. I, I haven't I watched could it. Be wrong. I could be wrong, but yeah, it is meant to be the same. Mm. Um, there's a follow-up question to at the beginning where we were saying about um, taking the photographs of the children in the kind of the junkyard. <coughs> Could you take that same photograph again? I know you answered it, but it's come back up. Um, if I wanted to take the type of photograph in the junkyard of children as they were playing, what is your advice? Um. I just wonder where where you would even find that now, but <coughs> excuse me. I can I can only say that when I when I did go back to Biker and I did see take some photographs of children, just one or two pictures of children outside without their parents. Um, I, I did find, I think there's only one picture where I, I couldn't ask anybody's permission because more, I mean, most of the photographs were indoors of children and of course you would then get the parents' permission. And I did see two little boys in a sort of funny, fancy dress out playing in the street. And I did see where their parents were and I did ask them, ask the mother. First, if I could take the picture, um, and I know that it it is especially you know if, if those pictures will then be used on social media like I don't know Instagram or wherever ever you you would want to showcase the pictures. I think there is a consideration there that some children may need to be protected yeah. um, for whatever reasons you know it's it's not quite the same as just sticking a photograph in a in a shop window or um, if, if you don't mind i'll give my opinion on it i would so, basically take the photograph you're probably going to be dealing with a different age of child than what we saw at the beginning so where we were seeing six, seven, eight, eight-year-olds or younger in the first image of the night, um, basically today you're more li likely, in UK at least, um, unless we were working within the traveller community, which would be a different scenario fully. Um, but if you were shooting, I would first of all say that they're going to be more of 18 than they are anything else. Uh, I would actually take the photograph before you get the permission. So just shoot it, but then go up to them and say, look, can you can you give this to your mum and dad to get in touch? Uh, I'd love to actually feature one of these images and blah, blah, blah. So I think it's much easier to do it. They've all got a phone. If you ask them to photograph your card, um, you don't even need to give, give them a card because they probably not take it anyway. Uh, but if you ask them to photograph your card, uh, even with the likes of a QR code on nowadays to take them to a place. But can you just actually get your mum and dad to actually get in touch, please? Because I'd love to actually uh, look at using this to do with a project that I'm photographing or wherever it is. But I, I would still encourage you to shoot before thought, because by the time you ask permission, the moment is gone. Oh, um, sure. sure. That's whether true. that is legal is another thing altogether. But um, before you actually start to show and tell it, um what what is the project you work you're working on you know i try and walk around with a camera the whole time um however um it's not with a project in mind it's just in case i see something that i really find attractive to photograph <laughs> whether it's a door people know my fetish of doors uh or it's a leaf on the ground or some stupid thing going on whatever it would be um but i would try and shoot the image um and then try and get permission. But you are going to be dealing with a different age group than what we were seeing in Circa's original images. Any to add, anything to add on that? 
Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, we've been having this conversation. Actually, we, we screened this film still here in Edinburgh, Edinburgh just the day before yesterday. And we did have a conversation there with the audience about um, the importance of documenting life as it is now, like life in, New in the UK, wherever you live. Because, uh, because of all these fears, what is happening is that there is no document being made. I mean, there's nothing, no record of, well, very little anyway, of, of how we lived through this decade and the one before even. Um, so if you find a way uh, to do it, it, it is a really valuable thing to do. Um, Maybe, I mean, one of the things that I have found in any case is if you become part of the community or uh, the subject that, that you're interested in photographing or an area and you become known that that's what you're doing and you are, it, it makes it, um, makes it easier to get a consent because once you once they know why you're doing it and you have a good enough reason for doing it and you're not there to harm anyone um you can find that that you you know doors are opened as it were i think it is much more difficult if you just go somewhere and start snapping and nobody knows who you are and what you're doing it for um you know it, it makes you puts you on your on your toes anyway it's it's a, if you i would say if you can explain it to yourself clearly why you're doing what you're doing then it's easier to explain it to others as well yeah. but yeah in terms of street photography i don't really know how far i haven't tried it actually myself because i have gone for this um negotiated and collaborative approach and still consider it to be documentary but street photography going back to the new biker um i felt that i just wasn't comfortable with it myself um and but i didn't really know what what was possible at all until i had been doing it for a while and then yeah you you find find new ways of doing it but do please document life now, uh, find a way. It's it's really important, really important. So Kalisa, thank you so much for tonight, sharing your images and your history. It's been amazing and showing some fantastic photographs. Thank you very, very much. Um, I hope this is the right link that Laura gave me. Is this the right one that we're looking at on screen? The Amber online that you see in that? Oh. Oh, where are we? I don't know. I don't know what you <laughs> where to look. Um, it's basically the amber side is what we're looking at, and the amber dash online dot com. Uh, yeah. You asked me to actually look at this. I'll put the post on um, Facebook anyway. If you've headed over to the Photographer Academy. Um, Facebook page, you'll have seen as well that I did a quick link to a YouTube documentary um, that I found of uh, Circa Lisa. Uh, oh, yes, yeah. Yes, um, a long time ago in a place far, far away <laughs> by <laughs> Biker. Um, yes. And that's really fascinating. I watched that, so I really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. Um, but there's some. Um, Good information. You'll see kind of the real life, I suppose, of biker in a documentary element and things really. But uh, again, as far as the amber side is concerned, uh, this is the oh. link and we'll share that later. Oh, later. this was a campaign for the side gallery. Yeah. Um, and we, we uh, had, you can actually. You know, we had, had the campaign for the side gallery because it, um, you, you're aware of that? Yeah, side gallery, safe side, where it lost its um, national portfolio status and it needs 
to find new funding to keep going. I'll put a post on the Facebook group anyway. Perhaps you can head over to there, Sir, Sir Kalisa, uh, tomorrow and just actually put uh, the right link in the comments and people can go to the page that they uh, that you want. Yeah, OK. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, amazing. Another great talk. Photography, uh, as I said, it will be ready for members to download uh, by Friday and it will be released on the YouTube channel within a few weeks for to rewatch. And uh, again, we hope that you'll join us for um, another great photographer in a few weeks' time and uh, to see another eight images. And I'm sure that Laura will be nagging Circa Lisa to come back on and perhaps pick on one of the, the uh, uh, projects and just talk about that folder and things, really. Circa uh, Lisa, thank you very, very much from me and everybody who's been with us and everybody watching in the, few, the future with it. Wish you all the success with. Uh, uh, the project that you've got going on at present she won't tell me what it is uh but uh, i wish you all the luck with that and things really i'm sure we'll get together soon okay thank you very much and thank you thank everybody. you very much bye everybody okay. have a great night try and thank still you. stay cool you. if you're in a very warm room like me bye-bye take care